Hey guys, my name is Matt Johnson with whoismatt.com and Sony just announced the A7S III. I feel like it's Christmas morning right now. I feel like Valve just released Half-Life 3, but instead of a crowbar, they're giving you a camera. I feel like Rose from Titanic. It's been 84 years! Well, okay, it's been like five years since the A7S II, but my point is, I'm super excited, this camera is finally happening. As I've said in my past few videos, this is the month of camera insanity. We've had new camera announcements from Canon with the R5 and R6 that shoot 8K and 4K respectively. Blackmagic announced the Ursa Mini 12K that shoots 12K. Nikon announced the Z5, which actually has a horrible crop in 4K. Let's not talk about that camera. And then comes Sony. Long hyped, long rumored, prophesied since the dawn of time, the ancient texts foretold it's coming, the A7S III is finally here. Does this feel real to you? This doesn't feel real to me. This is actually happening. Let's talk about this camera. What sort of video capabilities are the specs telling us we can expect? Was it worth the five year wait? And of course, how does the A7S III compare to the competition? Especially the new Canon R5 and R6. Starting off, I'll spoil my conclusion here for you. I think that with the A7S III, instead of needlessly chasing specs like Canon, Sony has been realistic with the A7S III and given filmmakers what they need as professionals. I'm going to repeat what I said in my videos about the R5 and R6 earlier this month. Overwhelmingly, filmmakers that I've talked to have wanted a camera that does three simple things. They want a camera that films 4K at 60 frames per second in full frame. Did Sony deliver? Boy, did they. The A7S III does that, but it also goes beyond to film 4K at 120 frames per second. But you should know that 120 frames per second does come with a 1.1 times crop. You also have the option of recording 60 FPS in either S and Q mode, which slows them down automatically and removes the audio, or in the regular video mode, which requires you to slow them down in post, but it keeps the audio. As someone that loves audio, I love that I have the option to keep the audio from the camera, even when recording at higher frame rates. It shoots all these frame rates in 10-bit 422 color, and it can record at a bit rate of up to 600 megabits per second in XAVC all-eye compression. And let's talk about that 600 megabits per second for a second. Comparing it to previous Sony mirrorless cameras, all of them, the A7S II, A7 III, A6300, A6400, A6500, A6600, A7R III, A704, <gasps> am I missing anything? Literally all of these cameras recorded in 4K at a maximum bit rate of 100 megabits per second. Did it look good? I mean, I'm shooting with it now and I've done it for five years, but there's definitely room for improvement. Enter the A7S III with a 600 megabit per second bit rate, six times higher than any previous Sony mirrorless camera. Now we need to wait for real world tests and reviews, but as someone that doesn't particularly enjoy math, I have not been this excited about numbers in a long time. Hold on a second now, because 600 megabits per second isn't the only bitrate option. The A7S III also gives you the option to film in 200 megabits per second H.265 XAVC HS compression. I'm very interested to see how the quality in this version compares to XAVC I, because it may be a great way to save space and still get a great quality image. Last thing we need to talk about in regards to frame rates and resolution, we have to talk about HD video. Really, Matt? HD? Come on, it's 2020. Who's actually still shooting in HD? Well, a lot of people are. If you read in comment sections, there's always people saying, 4K isn't happening yet. You don't need 4K. 4K is happening. But my point here is high definition video on the A7S III is insane. This camera shoots 1080p HD at up to 240 frames per second, super slow motion. What? <laughs> to put this into context, Sony came out with the FS700 in 2012, which had the headlining feature of filming 240 frames per second. This camera cost $8,000. Here we are about eight years later, and you can get the same performance in a mirrorless camera for less than half the cost. Going back to bit rates now, the 600 megabits per second bit rate of the A7S III also affects which memory cards you can use with the camera. This camera has two UHS-II 
SD card slots. Yes, the most common memory card format. These should be readily available and reasonably affordable. But Sony didn't stop there. They did something with memory cards that I've never seen a camera manufacturer do before. Something that was leaked and rumored weeks before the announcement, but I thought for sure was fake. While yes, the a7S III does have dual SD card slots like I said, it can actually take another memory card as well? What? I didn't even know this was possible. These memory card slots are also capable of taking the CF Express Type A memory card. CF Express mat, like the Canon R5 uses? Well, yes and no. CF Express is just the title for a type of memory card. Just like how SD cards have regular sized cards and also micro SD, but they're both called SD cards, CF Express has three different types of cards. Type A, Type B, and Type C. Type A CF Express cards are the newest. So new, in fact, that there aren't actually any for sale yet. But these CF Express Type A cards are very important for two main reasons. First, the UHS-2 SD cards the A7S III takes only go up to a maximum size of 256 gigabytes. But I'm sure they will get larger eventually. In contrast, CF Express cards go up to two terabytes in size. So I would expect much more storage space for your video files. See why it's important the a7S III supports CF Express? Now with the announcement of the a7S III, Sony also announced two CF Express Type A memory cards. These cards are 80 gigabytes and 160 gigabytes in size, but I would bet nearly any money that a lot of other memory card manufacturers are going to be making these cards as well with larger sizes in the near future. The second reason CF Express cards are a big deal is that if you want to record 4K 120 frames per second in the all I format, you have to do it using CF Express. SD cards are not supported when recording at this frame rate in this resolution. Last thing about memory cards. Because the a7S III has dual card slots, it supports dual recording in all frame rates and resolutions. So even if you're recording in 4K at 120 frames per second, you can record a backup video to a second memory card in case one fails. As someone that films weddings that are one take events that you have to get right and you can't redo the ceremony, I am so excited to see dual card recording supported on the a7S III. Now I'm sure if you've seen this camera specs at this point, you're probably thinking, Matt, you forgot one of the bit rates. Did I? Oh yeah, this camera also records RAW. Yes, if you don't want to use internal memory cards, this camera also has the option to use its full-sized HDMI output, yes it's full-sized, praise Jesus, to record video in 16-bit ProRes RAW to an external recorder like the Atomos Ninja 5. It's capable of doing this at up to 60 frames per second. Plus, remember those dual card slots? The a7S III can still record to both card slots while you're recording external RAW. Talk about backups. While I usually avoid RAW because of the rather large file sizes, I love that Sony is at least giving us an option to record RAW with the a7S III by using an external recorder. What else do we need to talk about? You wanna talk about low light? Low light, Matt. The a7S III is gonna be good in low light, like the a7S II. Didn't Sony in an interview say that the S now stands for supreme, not sensitivity? Psych, the a7S III is gonna be insane in low light. How insane? It goes up to 409,600 ISO. Wait a second, isn't that the same ISO as the a7S II? Hold up, Sony has built the a7S III with a back illuminated sensor, which is a fancy way of saying it lets in a lot more light. So yes, while the ISO maximum of 409,000 is the same, the a7S III is much less noisy at these higher ISOs. For context, I can comfortably shoot with the a7S II up to 32,000 ISO before I need to use any noise reduction plugins. It looks like the a7S III is going to be even better. As an added plus, while we're talking about ISO here, when shooting an S-Log3, the minimum ISO required is now 160. Also, I probably should have said this earlier, but Sony says that due to the faster readout speed of this sensor, rolling shutter is basically non-existent. As someone that doesn't film like Cloverfield, that hasn't been a huge issue for me, but if you like your video shaky, no more rolling shutter. Moving on, let's talk about IBIS. Not the bird, it's a pretty bird. We're talking about in-body image stabilization. My A7S II has IBIS, and while I can never imagine going back to a camera that doesn't have it, it's really only good for holding the camera steady or moving very slowly. Contrast this to the Panasonic GH5 and S1H, where you can literally walk with the camera and the footage still looks pretty stable. For video recording though, Sony has added something new for image stabilization. The new active image 
image stabilization mode, adds a 10% crop to the image, but offers even better image stabilization. Sony says the video you record in this mode is still 4K resolution too. I'm skeptical about this, as I'm skeptical about all forms of electronic video stabilization, but the test footage that I've seen does look promising, and we really need to wait for real world tests. Now, while Panasonic may still be superior to the a7S III whenever it comes to image stabilization, one area that Sony is far and above all other camera manufacturers whose name don't rhyme with revolutionary war weaponry is autofocus. One of the biggest weaknesses of the a7S II was its comparatively poor contrast-based autofocus. I never trusted it in my videos and have always used manual focus. That said, the a7S III may tempt me to autofocus. With 759 phase detect autofocus points and Sony's fancy eye detect autofocus for video. I'm so happy to see the a7S III supports autofocus with all frame rates and resolutions, and you can now adjust the rack focusing speed whenever you're focusing automatically. Now we just need beard detect autofocus. Look down here, focus on what's important, yes. <laughs> Anyways, want to talk about some good stuff now? What are you talking about, Matt? This camera already sounds pretty magical. I'm talking about good stuff. Changes that Sony's made to the a7S III that people have literally wanted since the first a7S was released. First off, as you've clearly seen in the b-roll now, it's got a flippy screen. YouTube vloggers and anyone that has ever tried to film themselves ever can rejoice. If you still want to use an external monitor though, the screen on the back of the a7S III will not black out while recording. So happy about that. Guess what else? It has a touch screen. And not like the touch screen on my A6400, which really only lets you touch to focus and do nothing else. With this touch screen, you can now navigate the new menus. New menus? I told you, there's so much good stuff about this camera. Finally, after many years of convoluted menus, Sony has finally reorganized the entire menu system into easily accessible settings that work with the touch screen. There's even an option to rename your video clips so they don't all start with the letter C. Know what else I love? Better colors. People have always complained that Sony's out of camera colors look too clinical at best or too green at worst. Sony says that the a7S III has been tuned to the same color science as their FX9 and Venice cinema cameras, so the colors should look quite good. There's no S Cinetone picture profile, so my wish list video that I made for the a7S III was not 100% accurate, but regardless, even without that picture profile, I'm hoping these colors are gonna look really good. Three things and then we're done. We're in the home stretch of talking about features for this camera. There's a new record button location. Remember the a7S I and a7S II had the record button awkwardly on the side? I immediately remapped that to C3. And then with the a7 III, Sony put the record button where C3 was. And once everybody's muscle memory got really locked into where that recording button was, they've changed it again. And the a7S III now has a record button on top. Next, we need to talk power. The a7S III uses Sony Z batteries, just like the a7 III, a7R III, a7R IV, and a6600. So Sony says we can expect to see about an hour and a half recording time per battery. Wait for real world reviews, but if these numbers from Sony are accurate, I will gladly take an hour and a half recording time over the barely hour recording time that I would get with my a7S II batteries. And as a bonus, the a7S S3 will also let you charge and power the battery using USB Type-C. I love that. Last thing, we've talked a lot about specs, but there is one more thing that we need to talk about, and I'm betting you can guess what it is. Sony chose to announce this camera at a very specific time. One could argue the perfect time. Just a few weeks ago, Canon announced the R5 and R6, which are very tempting for many filmmakers, if not for one big thing. Can you guess what it is? It's overheating. Of course it's overheating. I made a video a short while ago telling you my wish list for the a7S III. I ended that video saying this, Canon just made beating themselves easy. All Sony has to do is release a camera that doesn't overheat in an air conditioned room. Bold statement, but it's becoming all the more real as more overheating tests come out about the R5 and R6. Here's something I'm curious about, and you can put your tinfoil conspiracy hat on with me for this one. When the rumors were first coming out about the a7S III, they said it would be released at the end of June. Then, towards the end of June, the news came out that Sony delayed the launch by one month. My theory at the time was that Canon had just announced the event for the R5 and 
and R6 would be on July 9th. So Sony, smartly, did not want to have their event immediately get overshadowed by Canon with cameras that had better specs on paper like 8K RAW. I would now like to posit a new theory though. I think that Sony knew that the Canon R5 and R6 both had issues with overheating. And Sony said, what if we decide to wait for a month? to allow these cameras from Canon to be announced, give filmmakers time to realize overheating is going to be a definite issue with the R5 and R6, and then suddenly they announce the A7S III, two days before the R5 starts shipping, with just enough time for filmmakers to cancel their pre-orders and order the A7S III instead. I call this a conspiracy theory, but I actually know multiple people that have canceled their R5 pre-orders to now pre-order the A7S III. So you can take off your tinfoil conspiracy hat now, but it may be real. Now let's seriously talk overheating. I sound like a broken record now because earlier in this video and in my past videos, I've said that filmmakers want three things. A camera that records 4K at 60 frames per second in full frame. In light of the Canon R5 and R6 announcement and the subsequent drama that followed, I feel like I need to revise my statement. Filmmakers want a camera that records 4K in 60 frames per second in full frame that also doesn't overheat. That last one is important, arguably the most important, because who cares if your camera can record 8K if it can only do it for 20 minutes in an air conditioned room? That's not a usable or reliable feature. That's a number on a spec sheet. Let's bring it back to the A7S III now. Sony has said that the A7S III has a new cooling solution a graphite alloy heatsink that they say is five times better at dissipating heat than their previous cameras. Because of this, Sony has claimed that the A7S III will record for at least an hour in 4K 60 frames per second without overheating. In fact, they say the only reason it has a one hour limit is because the battery will die, not because the camera will overheat. Of course, I encourage you to be skeptical of this. We just have what Sony is saying right now from their testing, which was conducted at 77 Fahrenheit, or 25 Celsius. That is still an air conditioned room, just a slightly warmer air conditioned room than Canon used that was 73 Fahrenheit or 23 Celsius with the R5. With that, let's end this video by talking about price. The A7S III is available for pre-order for its September release right now at the links in the video description. And it costs $3,498. This is exactly what I thought Sony would end up charging for this camera. Look at history. The A7S released for $2,500 way back in 2014. One year later, the A7S II released for $3,000. Here we are in 2020 with the A7S III, and Sony follows the trend with another $500 increase to $3,500. In conclusion, like I said at the start of this video, Sony is giving us the camera we need as professional filmmakers to make good work. Sony isn't offering ridiculous specs like the Canon R5 with its 8K recording, but overheating tests are starting to show that the R5 may have flown too close to the sun anyways with features like that. In the present, I would argue that we as professional filmmakers need 4K. We need IBIS. We need good autofocus. We need dual card recording, good battery life, reliability without overheating. The A7S III is the first camera that I've seen, at least from the specs, that gives us all of that in full frame without compromise. So do I think it's worth the price? Let me put it this way. I've already put my pre-order in for this camera. But what about you? Do you think it's worth it? Have you been lured by the siren song of 8K raw internal recording with the Canon R5? Do you think the A7S III is lacking some specs and features that it needs? Please leave me a comment down below and let me know. And as I always say whenever I make a video about a camera, but it is especially true now, wait for real world reviews. Watch as many reviews as you can before you make a decision on which camera to purchase. Personally, I'm planning on making an in-depth real world review of how the A7S III works in regards to filming weddings. So if you're interested in watching that, I would love if you would consider subscribing. Also, speaking of weddings, if you happen to be a wedding filmmaker like me, you probably want to book more couples and film more weddings. To help you out with that, I've created a free PDF guide that's gonna give you some practical steps that you can use right now to book more couples and film more weddings. It's a free gift to you. You can download it at the link down in the video description. Thank you so much for watching and have a great day.